I like your last name. <laughs> I like yours. What's up, guys? Amanda Smith here with Lindsay Smith. Uh, thank you for joining me on this hashtag Smith Takeover. Thank you. So in your third season with the Suns, you know, I feel like so oftentimes we hear that comfortability and confidence go hand in hand with repetition and experience. What changes have you seen within yourself from year one to now? I think I'm just more comfortable just in general, to be honest with you. I feel like I'm much more knowledgeable about everything, whether it's the game itself or just what my goals are, or what my expectations are. Um, so I think that's been really helpful. I do think, though, that For me personally, I still get a little nervous every time I do something. And I kind of feel like you should your whole career or else you don't really have, in my opinion, you don't care as much about it anymore because you've gotten too comfortable or too complacent. So I think a little bit of nerves are always good. When those nerves do come up, though, how do you handle them in a way that it doesn't come across on camera? Um, when I first started out, I had a cameraman who told me that he heard somewhere, if you wiggle your toes that it's supposed to help with your nerves <laughs> and I know it's probably like an old wives tale or something but I still do it if I find myself like really nervous I just wiggle my toes and then I focus on that and then I'm like okay now you just gotta talk just say the story that you had planned and you're good <laughs> no, but it, I'm gonna try yeah, that. I have no idea if it's real or not but it, I've literally been doing it since like my second time ever doing anything on air So every once in a while, I'll catch myself just wiggling my toes in my (laughs) shoes. And then I'm just like, I feel a lot better about it. (laughs) Shout out to that cameraman. I know, right? Who wouldn't have known? Garrett. He was was my OG. (laughs) Shout out to you, Garrett. You know, having been the Sun's first ever digital reporter, how would you describe the benefit of working in that sort of platform for those looking to get into the industry? Well, I started my first season, I was just the digital host. And then I got really lucky. I was able to fill in as a backup sideline reporter. Um, And then my second year, our then sideline reporter got bumped up to play by play. So I kind of got bumped up to sideline. Um, But my first year was full time digital host. And it was still really fun because The great thing about the digital space is I feel like it's unlimited. So you have more ability to tell more stories. Um, Whereas like when you're doing sideline on broadcast, you have, you know, a very short window to get your story in. And, and I think any sideline reporter will tell you this. You've got hundreds of stories that go untold throughout the season because it just doesn't fit the flow of the game or there's just not enough time. Um, So I love the digital space for that aspect. Plus it's, it's 24 seven. So you don't have to wait until seven o'clock on Thursday night to get your inside scoops on what the team's up to or to hear these stories. And, and, you know, especially with younger generations and cutting the cord, you still want to be invested in your team, but maybe you don't have the access to watch every game without going to a bar or or heading over to your parents' house or borrowing somebody's login. (laughs) Because I've been there when I was in college, I was the same way. You know, so in the digital space, you're still able to engage and interact and know what's happening with your favorite team. And I appreciate that part of it. You know, while you were working in that digital space, how do you feel you put yourself in a position where then when that opening came to be a sideline reporter, your name came up in those conversations? I mean, for me, it just kind of got lucky because (laughs) to be honest with you, it just was it worked out really well timing wise. I had already had a year of being, you know, a face for the Phoenix Suns organization. So people knew of me already. Um, I had been able to build a relationship with the players and everyone on the business side here to where they had enough trust in me to also add on that sideline role um, onto my digital hosting role. And I kind of think, you know, it, it enhanced both sides for me because I'm able to, you know, the players about basketball, you know, during the sideline roles, but then I'm also able to go and do like a fun Christmas piece with them talking about who would make the best elf, you know, on the, on the digital side of things. So it kind of blends the two worlds together. And I think it just allows for you to have more personality um, overall in the entire role. But to be honest with you, it's, it's more work, but it's also not, if that makes sense. I don't know if that does because it's like, you're kind of doing the same job, but then you also just get a little bit more, airtime or more um, more opportunities to tell these stories maybe from both platforms 
So who would make the best elf? Because I know what everyone's wondering. <laughs> um, it was pretty much Ellie Okobo. He's one of our rookies this year. He pretty much was the, the front runner on that one. <laughs> Congrats to you, bud. <laughs> I know, right? Okay. We're just going to play a quick little fill in the blank game. Sun's edition. Okay. So in a game of horse. Oh, and this is going to be like you filling them in. Not okay. Clarify the rules here. In a game of horse, I think I could beat. I mean, are we being honest or am I just like. You can hype yourself here? up. I'm here to hype you because up. Because if I'm being honest, no one. <laughs> Except but for maybe my drummer. coworkers on the content side. I could definitely beat some of them. But if we're talking about players, probably no one. But if I had to take somebody on. I mean, it. I, if if I was able to pull it off and beat Devin Booker, I feel like that would be the most glory for me. So I would just say, like, go all out and take on, like, your best shooter. You I love I mean? your attitude. I'm a cheer for you. <laughs> if this ever happens. Well, and then if I lose, it's like, yeah, well, we already knew that that was probably what was going to happen. So mm-hmm. it's, like, extra glory if I win. And if I lose, it's like, well, yeah, everyone else would lose, too. I got all the faith in you, though. <laughs> Thank you. If I was sick... I would trust blank on the Suns to do my job. Um, Kelly Oubre Jr. Because he has actually done that to me a couple times this season where I'll be interviewing him and he'll just snatch my mic and then turn things around and start interviewing me or run off with the mic and the camera guy follows him and he's <laughs> interviewing random fans at an event or talking to his teammates or something. So I would say Kelly Oubre Jr. for sure. He'd have a lot of fun with it. That's the experience and repetition we were talking about. Exactly. Right. <laughs> In a game of two-on-two, two, give me, me and blank, versus Booker and Aiden. Now you really um, got to put it into perspective. Like Also on the Suns team or just in general, anybody? Let's make it like, like a streak, like a pickup game. So you can pick anybody. Huh. I just made that up because I just always make up the rules here. <laughs> Um, can I take Shaq, like, in his prime? Yes. Okay, then we'll I would do, do that. Time traveling. Yes, because I also think that um, I might have a little bit of the star power on my side. That Because I know DeAndre Ayton was super excited when Shaq said some really nice things about him earlier this season. So okay. maybe I could get Shaq to just kind of get in his head a little bit, maybe a little trash talk or hype him up a little bit and yeah. like, throw him off his game. So I'm going to take Shaq. I like the way that you think here. A little bit diving. Well, you know, I'm just, you know, I've got to play to my strengths. I'm 5'5", five five, so I already am on, like, the losing end of things here in terms of being able to beat these guys. So I, all is fair in love and war, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's the heart of a competitor. <laughs> we had some really great fan questions for you this week. So I want to get to as many as we can. You guys, I just hung up on Lindsay. I'm just <laughs> We're back. Garrett Klein 11 says, how's the culture around a team that has a good young core, but is rebuilding? So the culture here with the Phoenix Suns, um, you know, the players were very open about it throughout the season that it had its highs and it's had its lows. And, you know, earlier in the season, they were struggling a lot with that. But I think in the back half of the season, we really saw a really big shift for these guys. And I think that is just kind of a sign of hope for what's to come in the future, because, you know, we had the rough times where we were losing a lot of games in a row. And instead of them pushing each other away and maybe pointing the finger, they really pulled everyone closer and really created a family type atmosphere and said, instead of it being this person's fault or that person's fault, it's how can we fix this as a team, as, as one group of guys who have the same goal in mind. And um, I really liked that. We saw that a lot in the back half of the season, because I think that again, is just a, a good sign for what's to come for this team. So I think there's going to be ups and downs in every organization. Obviously, winning and losing dictates a lot of that. But you also have to remember the Phoenix Suns as a whole are pretty young. So you're asking some really young guys to lead in a situation where maybe they aren't typically a leadership type of person or they just haven't had the experience. Um, But again, I think we saw some really good glimpses um, throughout the back half of the season. So I'm excited. So... The Jay Slate, former guest on the Amanda Smith show, Jessica Slate. What's up, girl? (laughs) 
says, what's been your favorite game to cover? Um, this year, I would say both Milwaukee games for the Suns. Because we swept the Bucks this year, which I think is, is pretty impressive. And the first game, we were in Milwaukee. Jamal Crawford hit a game winner. Um, and that was just such a fun atmosphere. That locker room was such a blast afterwards. And then we also did it here uh, towards, the, towards the end of the season was when we were able to take down the Bucks a second time on the home floor. And I thought that was really fun because our fans got to experience it. And at the time, they were leading the league. So it was even more of just like, this is what we can do. Like, we are mm-hmm. capable of this. Now it's just a matter of, like, finding that consistency and, and you know, maybe adding a few pieces or just growing up a little bit because, you know, we had anywhere from, like, two to four rookies starting at any point in time this season. So um, those were really fun games to cover. And the atmospheres at both of them were wonderful. Next up. Tim Rushi would like to know, what helps you adjust to living in a new city for a job, but you're from Arizona, aren't you? I am. Um, I grew up in a town called Sierra Vista. It's about three hours southeast of Phoenix. Um, I did live in LA for a little while, right out of high school. I graduated high school early and just took off to LA because I needed a change of scenery. I wanted a big yeah. town. Like I just wanted something different. Um, I don't. I don't know. I think you just you either have it or you don't. You either want it so badly that you'll figure out how to adjust and how to make everything work, whether it's how to pay your rent or keep the lights on or go to school while you're pursuing your your dreams. I think if you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to make it work. And that's kind of how I did it, I, I think. <laughs> uh, hashtag preach. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like, you know, it's one of those things like, yeah. it's like getting a tattoo, right? Like, you know, it's going to hurt, but if you want that tattoo, you're going to, you're going to push through and you're going to deal with that pain because at the end of the day, you get what you want. So it's um, the same way. I'm so here for a good metaphor. So <laughs> are you kidding? I know. That's I'm going to call you say. back someday and like, <laughs> I need a life lesson. Do you have anything to tell me? I know. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's so random, but. It, no, I mean, that it, it was makes perfect. Sense. <laughs> that was like so perfect. I don't know how you just came up with that. I did just recently get a tattoo. So maybe that's why it was on the top of my mind. <laughs> it's on your mind. I also have a tattoo. So welcome to the gang. Nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mexi Katie says, what's been the most rewarding day of your career so far? That's a tough one. Um, shoot. I don't think I could pick just one because there's been so many great moments. Um, I would say it would probably have to go back to when I was still technically an intern and got my first uh, opportunity to do some on-air work. So this is kind of a funny story. Um, So I changed my major because I told you I lived in LA for the first out of high school. So my Mm -hmm. first two years of college, I did online living in LA and I just had like a general business communications degree program. Then when I became a junior and decided to move back to Phoenix and really pursue something that I felt passionate about and that I really wanted to make a career out of. So I picked journalism. So I changed my major my junior year to journalism and mass communications. So my, ju- my junior year, they ha- they, our school hosted internship fairs where you could interview with like five or six different companies trying to get an internship with them for that semester. And everybody I interned or I interviewed with basically was like, well, you're a junior. You should have so much more experience than what you already <laughs> have. Like, we don't want somebody as green as you. Like, that's why we're interviewing juniors and seniors. We wanted somebody who could come in and do stuff for us already. I was like, well, I mean, my bad, but like, yeah. I'm still down to work. Like I'm down yeah. to learn. So I didn't get any offers from that internship there, but I got really lucky because there was one company it was Cox Communications. They had their own channel here in Phoenix. They weren't able to make it to that internship fair. So they had to pick from all of us leftovers who didn't get an internship. <laughs> and luckily I was the best of the leftovers. So I got that internship and my boss, he literally told me from like day one, he's like, you know, I don't know if you have what it takes, but I'm willing to take a a chance on you. Basically, if you prove to me that you're willing to give everything to this and learn as much as you can, I will let you do pretty much anything that I can let you do to learn and grow. 
So two months into that, um, Cox got the Rattlers, which is which was the indoor arena football um, team here in town. And he was like, OK, so you've proved enough to me. Do you want to be on air? We'll we'll make you a social media reporter and we'll really bring social media into our broadcast. And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> yes. So I think that was just one of I feel like that might have been one of the most rewarding um situations days because it was just a matter of like him telling me if you put in the work and you prove it you will be rewarded at some point in time whether it's from me or somebody else just in general and it it literally happened so it was kind of like okay he's not just telling me this just to kind of blow smoke it's he's being genuine and and this is real life like you have to put in the work and you have to earn it and then if you do all of those things hopefully you'll you'll be rewarded with what you really want to do or what you really want in life. So I think that was pretty cool. No, that's awesome. And I feel like that's one of those situations where you dealt with that sort of rejection, but it didn't crush your spirit and you were right. like, no, this is what I want to do. I'm still going to go for it. And look at you now. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. All you other people who didn't want me to be your intern. This one yeah. was the best. And it was the best internship I could have asked for. So mm. I was super grateful that nobody else gave me an offer because I learned 90% of the things that I needed to know about this business and this industry from that internship. And it was all across the board. I mean, it wasn't just on camera stuff. Like I was, you know, carrying equipment. I was running a teleprompter. I was editing videos. I was stage managing. I was, you know, getting coffee for people and lunch and stuff. And I learned so much about what goes on behind the scenes. And I think that's really important when you want to be in front of the camera too, because you know how much work is being put in and you know how important those people are to what you're doing in your job. And then you don't make like crazy requests either. Like, oh, can we make this happen? And it's like, <laughs> girl, no. <laughs> like if you girl. knew even the slightest bit about what was going on behind the scenes, you would already know not to ask that. <laughs> okay. One final question from a fellow Smith, Brandon C. Smith 5. Welcome to the club. Being the Sun's first ever digital and content host, did you feel more pressure even with years of experience? No. Um, and I think the reason why is because um, a lot of my jobs that I've had have been the first for the organization or mm -hmm. the type of role that I had. So uh, my first couple years working in the business, I was full-time freelance. So I just kind of bounced around anywhere I could get work, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes. Um, like some of the stuff I mentioned earlier in my internship, uh, I was the first social media reporter for Arizona Rattlers broadcast. Then I met, um, a director of broadcasting at the Arizona Cardinals and I worked freelance for them doing some of their digital content as well. Um, and I was the first time they had somebody kind of really in that role. And then when I moved to the Arizona Coyotes, it was the first time they had hired a full-time digital host slash in-arena host. So they had in-arena hosts in the past, but they never had that dual role where you were creating content for web and social, as well as doing some in-arena stuff. Um, so when I moved to the Suns, it seemed like kind of a normal transition in terms of, you know, I got really lucky in getting into this business when that role was starting to really flourish. You were seeing more teams who were like, okay, we could really utilize this. It could become an asset for us, for our social channels, our digital channels to create more content, to reach our fan base um, and to engage with them. So I got really lucky in terms of the time that I did join or try and get into the business because that digital host role was becoming more and more popular. And now you see a good amount of teams across all the different leagues um, having somebody similar to this role, at least in, in a decent amount of them. Yeah. And I think that that goes back to what you were talking about before, that just sort of like preparation puts you in a position where you were comfortable moving into that new role. Right. Yeah. I think the, the biggest pressure for me was um, when I got to move into the sideline role here with the Suns, because I had never actually done sideline on this type of a level before like I did sideline reporting for high school football but it was a completely different type of broadcast and a little bit of uh, difference in the type of stories that you were telling or that I was telling from the sideline so 
this was the first real experience I had in the sideline role. And it was on a very large level. So I was definitely <laughs> nervous about that. because I was like, I don't want to let anybody down. I don't want to let myself down. But especially the people who like vouched for me and really, you know, went out on a limb and, and gave me that opportunity. So I think that was probably one of the more nerve wracking experiences. And my hey. very first game filling in on sideline was against the Warriors. So <laughs> I was like, you guys really... <laughs> You're like really, like really all, the, all of the eyes are on this game right now, and this is my first game ever doing sidelines, so it was kind of a sink or swim, and I, I think I did pretty well. So I wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a disaster. It wasn't uh, a complete yeah. success, but it wasn't a disaster. So you I was know happy. What you did. You wiggled your toes, <laughs> and you went on with your business. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I did. I just have to give a huge shout. Shout out to you for downloading Skype to talk with me. Thank you so much. Uh, I no really problem. It. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. This is so fun. Hopefully we get to meet in person one day. If I come out there with you, with the Suns next year, I'll, we'll definitely make sure that we get together. Heck yeah. And maybe do one of these in person with each other. Uh, that would be even more fun. <laughs> right. Instead of having, you know, to hang up because poor internet connection <laughs> this is real people this is this is real life okay guys for Lindsay smith i'm amanda smith thank you for being a part of our hashtag smith takeover we'll see you next time